last week, we were talking about what people really need. Today, we are talking about what people really need. This is part one of two. It's because I believe this whole chapter shows us what we really need. I did the same introduction last week, but who can remember that, right? <laughs> that was a week ago. Feels like a lifetime sometimes. But have you ever spoken to someone that just makes bad decisions? If you didn't, maybe you did this week. Or I put it like this. Have you ever spoken to someone and they keep telling you what they think and they keep telling you their plans and you keep going, ah, that's bad plans. That's a bad plan. That's bad decisions. You know, as the father of a toddler, I get it. I'm there with you. Everything my son does, it feels like, dude, this was a bad plan, right? <laughs> right? I told you last week, we have gates and locks and latches all over the house. She would look and be like, my goodness. Like, we're only missing a thumbprint. That's all we're missing. Then we need a thumbprint or a card to, like, enter and exit the building. You know, and most of our stuff, we, we've stacked as high as we can out of reach. Oh, my goodness, this week, guys, he's reaching things that I thought that I wouldn't have to worry about for another year or two. Just this week, he, I, I, had some, I had some Tums in my bedside table, and I thought, he'll never be able to reach that, ever. He's my little baby, right? He was, like, using them as maracas this week. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? And he was trying to bite them open. I go, no, it's a bad decision. That's a bad idea. And everything he does is like that. I told you my catchphrase as a dad is, what is it that you just put in your mouth, right? Everything in my life, it feels like I'm just dealing with somebody who makes constant bad decisions. But as you know, he's just trying to learn the world and he's trying to discover the world. But that means that some of the things he thinks are good decisions are actually really bad decisions. And you know, we think that we start to figure out life and as we grow up, if you talk to most people, they at least act like they know what's going on. But if you're like me, man, sometimes you wake up and you just go... Life is so difficult, and life is so complicated. And what the right answer is and what the wrong answer is sometimes doesn't seem that far apart. You know, in life, there, there's tons of things, for example, that people think that will make them happy, that, that if they get enough money in the bank account, that, that if they are maybe famous or, or at least get the recognition in their field, that, that Maybe if they get that right job with the right boss, then everything will turn out fine. Or they think, if I could just marry this person, then everything will be great. It'll be like a Disney movie, right? Happily ever after. I don't know about your guys' marriage. It's happy. Don't get me wrong. But like forever, always, no problems, no arguments, that's just not reality, right? Even if you have the perfect spouse, you're going to screw up, right? It's, they're going to have to correct you. It's just life doesn't work like that. But we think that if we do this thing and that we feel powerful, or we do this, and that we can make life comfortable, or if we could do that, and maybe people would affirm us and recognize us, or maybe if we could get this going in our life that we could be in control, then life will be perfect. And so we spend our whole life pursuing after those things. Now, I don't know about you. I've spent time doing those things, and it left me feeling fatigued, tired, anxious, frustrated, and just overall discouraged. In fact, you know, I talk to people all the time. That's probably my defining attribute is talking. <laughs> and as I talk to people, some people are like, I don't even know what my life is about anymore. They feel just totally disillusioned about what life is supposed to be. Well, if pursuing all of those things that we thought would make us happy and feel satisfied 
if those things leave us frustrated and discouraged, then what do people really need? What can help people, what can help set people free from all of these issues and maybe give them a new purpose and a new meaning and a new hope? Well, today, that's exactly what we're talking about. What people really need. Let me give you a bit of a background before we jump into this. We're the book of Acts. This is like the part two of two, right? You have Luke. Luke is all about Jesus. And then you have Acts. And you go, well, why didn't they just write one big book? Right? We've talked about this, that the scrolls can only be so big before you can't really handle them. And Luke is a big book. And so he filled up a scroll. Now he's starting a new scroll. One was about Jesus. Now this is about the church and everything after Jesus. And as we've seen, the Holy Spirit that was promised has come. And with the Holy Spirit has come unbelievable miracles. To the point that it's said in chapter 2, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Well, why did God give us the Holy Spirit? Why is he doing these miracles? For one reason. To be, does anybody remember? Witnesses. That's the whole point. That we share with others about Jesus and what we've seen Jesus do in our life. Simple. He gave us everything we need so that we could be a witness. Well, last week, right, we are talking about many wonders, many miracles are being done. Last week, we looked at a man who was lame since birth. And every day, he's brought to this gate right outside the temple, and he asks for money. Every day. Well, did that man need more money? Was that his big problem in life? No. It was that he was lame. And Peter said, look, I don't have silver or gold, but this I have to give you. You walk in the name of Jesus Christ. And he takes him by the hand, and it says the man leapt up. He leapt. But then he was able to walk, run, skip, leap. He didn't need someone else to give him a little bit of money. He needed to be able to walk. Well, today we're going to see that Peter is using this miracle in order to point people back to Jesus and what he has done. So let's take a look at that. Let's start in verse 11 in Acts chapter 3. This is what it says. While he clung to Peter and John, that's the man who was just healed, All the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. This is just this big open space where people came to do discussions and and be able to get a bunch of people together all in one spot. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? What a question, right? Right? They just saw a man that everybody knew that he couldn't walk since birth. Now he's walking, running, skipping around. Why do you wonder at this? Okay. Why do you stare at us? That's the main thing. As though by our own power or piety we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. We saw you do it. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given this man perfect health in the presence of you all. So how did the crowds react? They were astounded. And what they did is they they were exiting the temple probably, and they ran to the place hoping that Peter would get up and start talking about what just happened. Right? And so Peter does. And they're all there. They're all gathered. They all just saw this miracle. And so they all went right outside the gates. 
to listen to this discussion. And what does Peter do? I want to point out several things because what Peter does here, we can do in our own life. What Peter does here, we could do in our own life. Look at what he does. Peter says, why do you stare at us? He moves the focus off of himself and he puts the focus on Jesus. And while this sounds easy, right? I want to tell you this is far more difficult than we give it credit. This is one of those things that it's easy to do, or easy to say, hard to do. Why do we not put Jesus first? What do I mean by that? When, when people see us do something and they go, wow, that's so great. Or how do you get through this situation? Or, or whatever it is. Someone's giving you attention. Why are we not quick to say, yeah, but look at Jesus. There's one reason. Selfishness. It's selfishness. We want the affirmation. We want people to think that we are awesome. We want... We don't want to feel uncomfortable because once you start bringing up Jesus, you never know how someone's going to quite react, right? And probably more importantly, we want to stay in control. What do I mean by that? Like, well, if we start giving all of our credit to Jesus, well, what if people don't think that we're great anymore? Well, what if the situation gets awkward and they don't want to hear about Jesus? Let me tell you who is doing this. It's Peter. And while often we want to take someone like Peter and go, oh, well, that's the rock the church was built on, and, and Peter's the man. Remember, Peter's not the man, right? Peter had a lot of growing up to do. This is the same Peter that was arguing with the other disciples over who was the greatest. Jesus is with them, trying to teach them something, and they're not even listening because they're so busy arguing, oh, well, who's, like, who's going to be like you know, the first mate. Who's going to be the number two in the kingdom? Who's, who's the best one among us all? Peter was part of that. Peter was probably the one being the loudest about that. This is the same Peter who could not stay walking on the water with Jesus because he started worrying about the waves. It's not like Peter blocks out all worry, right? Peter is somebody that when things start to come in on him and he thinks that things are going to get dangerous or uncomfortable, he worries about them. No other opportunity shows this, or no other place shows this than when Jesus was taken to be hung on the cross. Jesus told Peter, you're going to deny me. Three times he said, no, I'll never deny you. I'll always be with you. I'll always be right beside you. And what does he do? He denies him. And why you say, well, man, maybe he was trying to protect himself. And definitely so. Maybe people were just trying to figure out who he was. Remember the people who were even asking him if he walked with Jesus. It wasn't like the police. It wasn't like the guards or anything. And yet he denied them. Peter doesn't have a perfect track record. But we see here, Peter's growing up. And as Peter's growing up, he's doing more and more what God is asking him to do. Well, now here is Peter, who through the power of God, you see a miracle. And what is the first thing that he does? He doesn't say, yeah, look at me. I'm the best. He doesn't say, yeah, well, you know, it's not a big deal. Thanks. He makes a big deal to say, don't stare at me. Don't look at me. You need to look at Jesus. You need to look at the one who really is doing all the work. You need to see the one who through me is really performing miracles. But not only is he taking his focus and moving it on Jesus, he then is going to share who Jesus is. 
okay? Listen to this. He says, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare? As though by your own power or piety we have made him walk. The God of Abraham and Isaac and God of Jacob and the God of our forefathers glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. But then look what he does. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know in the faith that through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. I want to give you really truly four steps, but I want to give you three of those steps right now. And if you're going, oh, I don't have a pen or whatever ex- your excuse is, if you are part of our text in church, I'm going to text you these four steps of how to share Jesus with the people around you. Okay? This is the first step. Move the conversation to Jesus. So often I find when I talk to people, they're like, I would like to share Jesus. That I, I know that you say that's something I should do, but it just feels impossible. Just start giving God all the credit, right? When people come to you and they're saying, man, you know, you look so good after your surgery. You you look so much better. Start talking about Jesus, right? That's not hard. That's, yeah, Jesus is taking care of it. Yeah, you know, yeah, I'm working hard in PT or whatever, but like without Jesus, you know, I'd never be able to get over this. I'd never be able to get over that. When you do a good job at work, and people are like, hey, good job. You should be like, no, I'll credit the Jesus. This is one of the things I do like to see in athletes, right, is when they say, hey, first and foremost, yeah, I had a great game, but all glory to Jesus Christ. But I think the problem is they move the conversation to Jesus, but then they're like, Okay, let's talk about football again. I'm like, let's talk about that Jesus thing some more. Let's talk about how Jesus granted you all of these abilities. Let's talk about how Jesus has given you the mind and the body to be able to perform like you just did. Let's keep giving credit to Jesus. Move the conversation to Jesus, the step number one. Step number two, I want you to see this. Talk about what Jesus has to do with them. Bring them into the story. Don't just say, yeah, Jesus is all good with me. Too bad for you. <laughs> you know, like, sorry that Jesus isn't as good to you as he is me. No, bring them into the conversation. And one of the ways that Peter is going to bring them into the conversation is that he is going to talk about what they did and show their great need for Jesus. Look at what he says. Peter doesn't play around, right? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. In other words, why was Jesus killed? Was it because of Pilate? Mm, Doesn't seem like it. Seems like Pilate was going to release him. Well, then why did he die on the cross? Because you kept saying, kill him, crucify him. And so what happened? You took back... A murderer. You said this guy who we know has murdered people, bring him back to us. But kill the holy one, the righteous one, the author of life. Make sure that he suffers on the cross. And yet, what have you seen before you? The guy that you killed, it's in his name that all healing is coming. So Peter, what does he do? He moves the conversation to Jesus, and he says, you need Jesus. Now, I don't think that we have to say, well, you killed the author of life. I think that's a little bit strong for some of our friends and family who are far, far off, right? (laughs) If you just start saying, you killed Jesus, then it might get a little bit. But one way that you could do that is you start to talk about your life before Jesus, Oh, now we're starting to be on common ground, right? This is why our testimony is so powerful. 
This is why we want to tell others about what God has done in our life. One of the things that Peter could say is like, look, you know, you killed, I denied him three times. Then Jesus came back from the dead and he kept having to ask me, Peter, do you love me? Do you guys remember that? Peter, do you love me? He kept having to ask him and ask him because Peter, he, he was so guilty. He felt like he couldn't love Jesus anymore. And Jesus had to keep asking him until not only did Jesus forgive him. Come on. This is going to take an amen right here. Not only so Jesus could forgive him, but he could learn to forgive himself. Amen. Come on. So not only do we move the conversation to Jesus, but we talk about how they could use Jesus. You know, before Jesus, I, I did this. Before Jesus, my life was a wreck and it looked like this. You know, before, without Jesus, I don't know where I would be. I, I know my, my problem areas. I know the things that I've done even though I've been walking with Jesus. I can't even imagine if I didn't have Jesus or I had to grow up and, and recognize what I really believed about Jesus. And, you know, two years ago, I wouldn't be this guy. But now the guy that you see that you're complimenting, you could have that too. They look at you and they say, how are you dealing with? with your husband or your wife being sick for this long. Well, I got joy because Jesus, and without Jesus, I don't know where I would be. This lets people know, hey, the struggles and the stress and the anxiety and the frustration that you're going through, you also could have freedom from that in Jesus Christ. Move the conversation to Jesus, then bring people into the story. Step three. Compare the goodness that you or someone else has received with the gift of salvation. Yeah, you know, Jesus has really helped me through this surgery. Yeah, Jesus has really helped me through these problems I've been having with my kid. You know, Jesus has really helped me through this financial situation. But you know what? I would be nowhere without what Jesus has really done on the cross. You want to know why I have joy when I shouldn't, peace when I shouldn't, patience when I shouldn't, goodness when everything seems to be melting around me, and love when I should feel so alone? It is because of what Jesus did on the cross. It begins there. Share that with people. They need to hear that. So those are three steps. Let me give you an example of how I would use... These three steps. This is all hypothetical. You know I did have cancer, but Jesus was with me every step of the way. Now I know Jesus is with me through everything that I'm going through. You know that Jesus is there for you too. Bringing them into the story. Through whatever hard thing you're going through with Jesus, he's there for you. And though he saved me from cancer, man, that doesn't even compare. Because if he would have killed me with this cancer, I at least have a hope. That's way better than just being in remission. I have a hope that no matter which way it went, that I would have an everlasting life that really doesn't go away. So it doesn't matter what I'm going through. Part of the reason I could have joy and peace and patience and goodness and gentleness and kindness and self-control. The reason why I feel love when I shouldn't. Is because I know no matter what happens, Jesus has prepared a place for me. I know that no matter what happens, this isn't the end. No matter what your past has looked like, no matter what your future might hold, if you have Jesus, you know what you could place your hope in. Those are just three steps. These aren't hard. I'm going to text them to you. But this is what we have to do in a world that so desperately needs hope. When I talk to people, guys, I don't know if you guys just talk to people outside of here. There's not a lot of hope. People are grabbing on to whatever they can. But if they only had Jesus... It would start to change everything. I know it. 
if we are called to be witnesses, which we are, we need to learn how to make our life a witness both in word and deed. Learning how to give Jesus all the credit and tell people how Jesus has changed you is one of, if not the most important aspect of being a witness. Be able to tell your story and be able to tell people how they fit in that story. So what does Peter do? He tells who Jesus is. Now he is going to tell them how they can accept Jesus. This is step four, but I'm going to read some first. Verse 17, let's read. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance. In other words, you didn't know that Jesus was the author of life. You didn't know that he was the holy one. You didn't know he was the righteous one. As did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he fulfilled. He did it. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Here's the salvation part. This is where people need to react, right? Move the conversation to Jesus. Tell people how they fit in the story. Brag on Jesus and his salvation. This is how you could accept salvation. You repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may not be blotted out. The times are refreshing. Do you guys read that? I want you guys to see that. Let's read that again. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Christ appointed for you Jesus whom heaven must receive until the time of restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago Moses said the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers and you shall listen to him whatever he tells you and it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people and all the prophets who have been spoken from Samuel to those who came after him also proclaim these days you are the sons of the prophets that the covenant that God made with your father saying to Abraham and your offspring shall all have uh, all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. One of the first things he does is he talks about Jesus' salvation and he gives them a chance to respond. He gives them a chance to respond. You know, it, in preaching, there are two aspects of the sermon that I have found could easily be overlooked. One is application. In other words, what does the Bible have to do with me? And then I found that uh, a lot of preachers, unfortunately, uh, are pretty weak in their conclusion. So they just kind of seem to hastily wrap it up and there's no direction, which is a problem. If you don't have application or a good conclusion, It leaves two questions for every listener. So what and now what? So what and now what? In other words, when we share Jesus, we not only should tell them what Jesus has done for you, not only should we invite them in the story and tell them what Jesus can do for them, and not only should we point to his salvation, we need to tell them what the next step is. And even if you're not ready to go through or if they're not ready to fully accept Jesus right there on the spot, give them something to do. In other words, you think that me having Jesus is a good thing, and you think that Jesus could give you something, come to church with me. That's not hard. That's an easy, so what, now what type of thing to do. You know, I know what Jesus has done in my life. I think he could do it for you. How about you come to church with me on Sunday? That's not hard. If you're really ambitious, you know I'm reading through the Bible in a year. How about you read a chapter or two with me, and we'll talk about it. There's your so what, there's your now what. I I believe that God's going to show us something. Give them something to do. I think so often what we do is because we don't want things to get too awkward, we go, oh, all God be the glory. And then we give them nothing to do. So what you've basically said is, I got God. I got the answers. How about you go figure it out? That doesn't help anybody. 
We're, we're all about helping people be set free. How do we do that? We just tell them what we've seen. We tell them what we've experienced. We tell them what we believe. But once you tell them, you got to give them something to do. I'll give you a great example of that. And this is probably why Peter then goes into this application, answering so what and now what, now that he talked about Jesus. Because if you remember in Acts chapter 2, he had a whole sermon about Jesus. And you know what the people asked him once he was done? They looked around and they said, brothers, what should we do? We... <laughs> He didn't tell them what to do next, and then he was like, oh, okay, well, uh, well, you need to repent, and you need to be baptized, every one of you. That's, that's the next step, and at least he's learning, right? And preaching, we say the only thing that makes a good preacher is more reps. It just takes time. Well, he's getting more reps in. He's like, I need to tell them what they need to do next. And he says, look, you need to repent, But I want you to hear, this is so good, if they repent. If your friends and family and neighbors who are far off repent. And let me make this more personal, if you repent. This is what God has in store for you. I want you to hear this, man. I re I've read this a hundred times. This is one of those things that jumps out at you and just, ah, it just engulfs you. You know what I mean? Listen to what this says. It says, repent therefore, this is verse 19, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Verse 20, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Who needs some refreshment in their life today? Who needs Jesus to come and just make things make sense again, to just give some peace, to just make it to where you don't feel so frustrated and worn out, that you need something cool and refreshing. Let, let me tell you how cool this is. So this, this word refreshment here is something that they use in the Old Testament a lot. Uh, in Exodus, when they had the plague of frogs, where there were frogs everywhere and it was miserable, God stopped that, and it uses this word refresh. Because it felt like life was being piled on and piled on and piled on, and there was no way around it, and it just kind of felt disgusting, and just you felt so lost, and like, what's going to stop this bad thing from happening? And it said, and then God eased it up, and it all went away. That's what this word means. It's also used in Exodus 23 as a Sabbath rest for everybody. Rest for your slaves. Rest for your workers. Rest for your animals. That everybody needs rest and refreshment. Uh, 1 Samuel 16, it, it talks about Saul with the Spirit of the Lord left him and he was tormented. You think you have demons. King Saul had some demons after him. said he was tormented night and day until David would play his harp and all the problems that he had on his heart and on his mind and on his soul seemed to go away and it was refreshing. That's what Jesus is promising today. The weight of sin, the weight that you have on you that you have to be good enough, that you have to earn salvation, that you have to take care of everything, that everything gets lifted off your shoulders. Remember, this is the same Jesus who said, come to me all who are heavy laden. Come to me everybody who's got problems, who's got stress, who's got anxiety, who's just feels like you can't take on the world anymore. Come to me, those people. And you know what he says? I will give you rest. I will give you refreshment. All of the problems lifted off your shoulders. If you repent, change your mind, walk with God, he says, I will make your life refreshing. Not only will you be refreshed, we look forward to restoration. Look, look at what he says after. In verse 20 it says, and you will, 
and, and in times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, that you may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. But what did his holy prophets say? Well, Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers, and you shall listen to him, whatever he tells you, and it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. You're either part of the restoration or you're not. Verse 24, and all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days. This is their proclamation. This is the restoring. That you could be restored to partially now, but definitely once Jesus comes again. He says, you are the sons of the prophets and the covenant God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servants, sent to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. And if you accept Jesus now, he will change your life. Because what you believe about Jesus changes how you live your life. If I know that I was created to be in relationship with God, that changes how I view God. If I know that part of my relationship with God means that God gives me the Holy Spirit so when I look at the Word of God, He shows me what it means and applies it to my life. If I have the Holy Spirit of God, even in my groanings, when I don't know the right words to say to God, He interprets them so God knows exactly what I mean and more importantly, exactly what I need. If I know about this Jesus who gave me the Holy Spirit to go and be a witness... That doesn't mean that I could just sit in the background anymore. It doesn't mean that I could just live my life trying to ignore the people that I want to ignore, ignore all the drama that's going on, and just have my family and focus on my family and my finances and everything, and then you'll be good. No. When you come to know Jesus, you come to understand what life is all about. And that if you live that life, if you do what God is asking you to do, there is freedom and there is goodness and there is love and there is satisfaction. And what Peter is saying here is the prophet said there will come a time where, you, where the one who will come and he will help you turn from your wickedness. Well, he has come in the person of Jesus Christ. Well, how do I share that with someone? I make the conversation be about Jesus. I tell them what Jesus did for me and tell them that Jesus could do it for them. I invite them into the story. Step three, I tell them about the salvation that is in God and then I give them something to do. When it comes to be wit being witnesses, Gosh, we make a lot of excuses. We make a lot of excuses. I, I've heard some of these. Well, I didn't share because it wasn't the right time. Maybe. I, I didn't share because what if I said the wrong thing? Doubt it. I didn't share because it wasn't a good opportunity. My argument is, how many opportunities have we missed? How many times would have been the right time, but we didn't even try? How many times was an opportunity standing right in front of us, and all we had to do was start saying the name of Jesus, and we just didn't? How many opportunities have we missed because we thought we had to be perfect, even though salvation has nothing let me repeat this. Salvation has nothing to do with you and your presentation of Jesus and has everything to do with God and the Holy Spirit moving on somebody. How many opportunities have we missed? 
because we weren't being intentional or we just didn't care. Church, I preach passionately about this. And I'm giving you these steps and I'm showing you what the Word of God says because we do not have time not to share. The world does not have time not to hear about Jesus. The world does not have time for you to make excuses. You might look at it and you go, well, you know, Jesus said he's been coming back for 2,000 years. You know, I, I think that there's some time, Brant, for this generation. How many generations are we as Christians going to let pass before our eyes before we realize the urgency of sharing Jesus in our lives? How many loved ones, neighbors, co-workers have to go before we realize the importance of just sharing Jesus? Jesus, inviting someone to church at the very least. How many opportunities do we have to waste? If you can brag on God, that's what we're talking about. If you could brag on God and say, Will you come to church to me, uh, to someone, you better do it. It's what they really need. This is the main point I want you to leave with. Just brag on God. You know, if you start bragging on God, that's a great place to start. If you start talking about what God has done for you, it's a lot easier to then say, well, God could do it for you too. And this is how God can do it for you. And give someone something to do. Brag on God. Give God some credit. This is the challenge I want to give to you this week. I just want you to tell one person this week about what God has done in your life. Just brag on God. It doesn't matter who it is, what it is. Someone gives you a compliment, you just go, thanks for the compliment, you know, God gave me the smile or whatever. You could be as cheesy as you want. I don't care. It's your challenge, right? But I just want you to start by bragging on God because if we could do that first step, then the subsequent steps become easier. And this is something that doesn't need to just happen every once in a while. This needs to become a habit in our lives, that we are people that brag on God. I want us to be a church that brags on God, that when we see new people come and they say they want to be part of the family, it's not because of Brant. It's not because of the family that brought them in. It's because God wanted them to be a part of the family. When we see people who come and are saved and are baptized, it's not because of Brant. It's not because of someone who even shared the gospel. It's because God is doing something. If we are a people and a church that brags on God and God first, and honestly, God alone, then I think we'll start seeing so much movement we won't, need, we, we won't even know what to do. You know, that's what Jesus has done, right? Jesus, who created the whole world, it said, author of life. He came because he saw us in our sin and our shame, and he says, I want to rescue those people. I want to set those people free. So he came fully God, fully man, born of a virgin, to live a sinless life. All so that he could die on the cross for your sins and my sins. For all the things that separated us from God, he wanted us to bring, bring us back to God. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And he rose three days later that he had the power over death. That he can give you the everlasting life. And if he could give it to you, by golly, he could give it to everybody else who's out there. And they are looking for a hope. They're looking for something to live for. They're looking for what life is about. Paul tells us, how will they know if they haven't heard? Let's start bragging on God. Let's pray. Mm-hmm.